Hi, I'm Frank Diamond, the Managing Editor of Infection Control Today, where we're giving infection preventionists and other healthcare workers the information they need to battle COVID-19. Eventually, somehow, we'll beat COVID-19, perhaps because of a vaccine or maybe herd immunity will finally kick in. But there will be life after COVID. There will also be health care after COVID. There will be new challenges awaiting infection preventionists. What might they be and how should they be addressed? My guest, Mary Jean Ritchie, can help provide some answers. Ms. Ritchie has a lot of experience as an infection preventionist. She is the Director of Clinical Education at Drexel University College of Nursing and Health Professionals. She is also a nursing supervisor at Fox Chase Cancer Center in Philadelphia. And I am also proud to say that Ms. Ritchie is a member of Infection Control Today's Editorial Advisory Board, a great addition. Mary Jean, as always, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Frank. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you today. So I know this is like a very global question to start off with, but what do you think will be the main challenges for uh, healthcare and infection preventionists when COVID finally goes its way, which we all hope will be sooner rather than later? Well, I think that our antibiotic resistant organisms are still um, going to be prevalent and um, we're still going to need our, uh, to c complete our surveillance and our data collection methodology. Um, we need to really start thinking about how we can develop networks to prevent these infections by sharing the strategies that are working within the hospitals um, to protect the patients. Um, I think that we're going to have to also look at how we can improve antibiotic use. And I think networking may help in that area. We all have committees, pharmacy committees in hospitals, antibiotic use committees, but um, maybe somebody has a strategy where they're seeing um, great results. So maybe if we start um, you know, sharing that and developing stronger networks. The other big issue that's out there uh, of course, is hand hygiene um, compliance. That's one of my um, favorite topics because for years we've been saying um, we need to get employees to wash their hands, um, but yet our numbers still are not 100%. It should be, you know, one of those never events where we always wash our hands. So we need to change our education practices. We need to um, change our messaging to, uh, to reduce the infections. Um, through hand hygiene compliance. I think we've reached the point where um, it has to become a never event. We have to be up there at the 100% level in order to prevent the infections that are occurring. Um, and COVID was or is a, an example. The other thing is environmental hygiene. Do we have the resources to go into our environment with our current um, EVS or environmental service workers and actually clean the high contact area surfaces um, as frequently as we should. The toilet handrails, the light switches, the doorknobs. We clean the patient's rooms, we remove the trash, but are we doing the high contact areas at the nurse's station and the patient's rooms as often as we should? We have um, strategies in place that um, mandate um, ORs to um, keep data on um, sterility and cleaning the ORs, but we don't have strategies or we do not have to even report um, room cleaning to the degree that we do in the OR. So we need to think about that. I think C. diff remains a, a prevalent disease where we have to get it under control. It's still spreading in units. Are we doing the patient high contact areas frequently with bleach to reduce the spores on um, the immediate patient re environment. So there are big things that I think we need to look at in addition to how do we prepare for the next pandemic. Um, and I noticed that you say we need to do this, we need to do that. Um, when you say we, who, are you talking about infection prevention? Are you talking about healthcare professionals as a whole? It sounds like a, um, a lot of what you said, is that all the bailiwick of the infection prevention or is that hospital administration, or, or who does that belong to? I think it's the infection prevention personnel's responsibility to educate the um, administrative um, arm of the hospital so that they can um, put the um, resources, the financial resources into hiring more um, EVS workers, to um, hiring more infection prevention um, personnel so that they can track and uh, do the data uh, surveillance that we need to do. I know uh, you said hand washing is one of your uh, 
your pet problems. And I, you have a great article coming up in one of our print editions uh, about hand washing. Does it does it bother you, or does it perplex you, or or so much that that people just don't do it? I mean, I've been covering this now for a while, and it just kind of blows my mind that people just won't healthcare professionals just won't take the time to wash their hands. Or is it a case they just feel like they're too busy to do it? I think it's a multitude of problems. We've studied it. It's everything from um, busyness forgetfulness, lack of convenience, not having the um, hand hygiene, um, alcohol-based dispensers in the appropriate place. Um, th some of the employees don't want to use the alcohol base because it's drying to the hand. They want to go to the sink, then they forget they get caught up going into another patient's room. I think there's a multitude of reasons why people don't wash their hands. I think that one of the biggest strategies that we need to consider as um, infection prevention personnel is how do we educate um, the um, physicians, the nurses, respiratory therapists, you know, general hospital personnel, nursing home personnel about the importance of it. We have to change the messaging. It's kind of like um, back in the 70s and 80s, wearing the seatbelt, stopping smoking. I mean, it almost has to be creative continually. There has to be, for lack of a better way of saying it, like digital reminders everywhere. And you have to change that so that um, it's not like just a blank white screen when it comes up, wash your hands when you turn on your computer in the morning. I think we have to be really creative so that people see the message in different areas. So I think we need to change our messaging and I think we need to um, change where the messaging is occurring. Do you think there are, there are enough infection preventionists to go around? No. I think that the, there are new organisms, the, the pandemic right now with co, uh, the coronavirus has proven that we're not only keeping um, the data on all the current infections, all the MDROs, but now we're tracking um, who's dying, who um, is not recovering, who's in the ICU. So we need more people to do the data surveillance and the um, tracking of information to prepare reports for administration. I think we need um, additional help in those areas. Most facilities only have one or two people, unless you're a large major institution where you may have uh, more. Usually in long-term care, the infection control practitioner is also the educator or maybe the DON or maybe a nurse manager doing that. So um, it's um, an area where we haven't put a lot of resources. Do you see, this may not be your purview, but do you see state governments possibly stepping in and saying that this is an important profession, infection prevention, this is an important profession, and you need to, nursing homes especially, you need to have somebody on staff who is a certified infection preventionist? That would be ideal. I think that um, we probably should think about is now the time after COVID to start um, lobbying our state representatives and um, legislators to actually mandate um, certification in these facilities. I know you have you, you, you have some teaching in your background. What would you tell somebody, a young person now who uh, wants to become an infection preventionist? What would the, after COVID, what would you say to him or her? Do you mean in terms of how they how should the be? How to do the job. I mean, if you're, if you're chatting, if you're just chatting up with them at, the, uh, at a cocktail party, how, what are the challenges of the job and how and what to expect and, and what to expect now? Well, the first thing I would say is you have to have a real serious understanding of it of infections and how they're passed or transmitted in the hospital. And then um, basically try and be certified, um, try and pair up with an infection control practitioner so you can see what the job is really like. Um, also, I think the person has to be pretty dynamic. They have to be willing to not only collect data, come up with plans to eradicate infections or mitigate, um, they have to also be the person who's going to be able to go out there and do education um, with the staff and do it in a meaningful way so that it leaves a lasting impression. You strike me as somebody that wherever you work, you're always listened to by the administration. Uh, does every infection preventionist have that kind of clout? I, I mean, would. I would hope so. I, I can't say that everyone does, but I think with um, the fact that we have to um, give data on 
um, Cordy's and um, Clabsies and things like that, that um, administration is listening to um, our infection preventionists now because reimbursement is also tied to infections, as you know, we're very well aware. And what about uh, the whole area of uh, uh, personal protective equipment? Do you see anything changing as a result of COVID uh, regarding uh, supply of personal protective equipment or, or, or the way it's handled or the way donning and doffing go on? I think the biggest thing that we are learning in this um, pandemic is that we don't have enough. We did not stockpile. There's no, no strategic center or where people can get PPE um, to stockpile it for the next pandemic, whether it be a resistant strain of flu. Um, I mean, everybody's anticipating that the flu is going to be bad this year on top of um, COVID. So I think that um, the lack of PPE is a big problem is how do we encourage um, staff to get the vaccination if there is a vaccination for COVID. Currently, we have um, employees in facilities caring for patients who do not get um, the flu vaccine and don't have a medical reason for not doing it. Um, and most facilities, because we need employees to care for patients, will mandate the use of a mask from you know, November or December 1st to March 30th. So how are we going to encourage employees to get um, the, the uh, COVID vaccine even? So I think that that's a big area where infection control practitioners are going to have to focus their energy to encourage, um, you know, receiving the vaccination when this is over. I had like, because I look at the number of people who can't get flu shots, who don't get flu shots for many, many different reasons, are, are healthcare workers, not just the public, going to take the vaccine, especially with it being novel? You think it should be made mandatory? It probably will be. Okay. Mary Jean Ritchie, thank you so much for visiting today. Uh, a member of Infection Control Today's Editorial Advisory Board, it's always a pleasure. Thank you, Frank.